for us, every day is a new opportunity to make sure our first impressions are always our best and to see possibilities on the horizon. To make our facilities and services more accessible and find freedom all around us. With a location proximity to active markets, with a liberal air transportation policy, that daily pursuit is how we turn everyday opportunities for you. For all destination marketing support, customized packages for new existing airlines and operators, and for a highly ranked tourist destination, the Gambia Civil Aviation Authority is here to serve. We regulate air transport, operate and manage BIA technical requirements, merge with commercial considerations. We have experienced and well-trained aviation professionals to cater for your needs. For investment opportunities in building airport hotels, shopping malls, playground for children, do contact us on 4472-831, 4472-893. Gambia Civil Aviation Authority. We go beyond daily. Stewart and Co. Solicitors, a legal excellence firm in London that can help you with all aspects of your legal work. If you are looking at immigrating to the United Kingdom, Stewart and Co. can help you to set up business, buy houses in the UK, and will deal with all your legal works from start to finish. For all your general immigration work, we can help you with that as well. If you apply for any form of visa, where the student visas, settlement visas, marriage visas, or a child wanting to come to the United Kingdom to settle with the family, we can help you to achieve your goals. Stewart and Co. Solicitors, a legal excellence firm specializing in conveyancing, immigration, litigation, family law, personal injury, licensing, no win, no fee. Contact us today at www.sk-solicitors.com. And do small or big projects with the same dedication and commitment as we do. With the reputation as the leading printing company in the country, when it comes to major projects and innovative solutions, we always deliver in high quality, thus receiving the trust and confidence of our clients. From the moment your order is placed to when it is delivered, we believe in exceeding expectations from the sales manager to the production team, the account manager, and the person delivering your material. We have state-of-the-art equipment and a highly experienced and competent workforce that enables us to deliver top quality work on time. At reasonable prices, we provide our clients with multiple solutions right from conceptualizing, designing, printing, binding, publishing, and distribution. For all your printing requirements, we are strategically located at the Sankumsila Highway, the Gambia Printing and Publishing Corporation. We print what you desire. When we touch down, but I broke down. Gamtel G Fiber, now you can enjoy super fast internet in gigabytes. G Fiber is affordable, stable, secured, and accessible to homes, businesses, and enterprises. With Gamtel G Fiber, the future is speed. Gamtel, creating a brighter future in communication. Hello and welcome to another edition of uh, Kirfatu. Uh, tonight I have a very um, uh, big guest, of course, a uh, Gambian-based professor. Um, he, Dr. Conte, teaches at the University of Minnesota. He teaches accounting and finance. Doctor is a big activist on Gambian issues. His um, area mostly is governance. Um, the economy, the state of our economy, and of course uh, our education system. Doctor, welcome to Care Fatu. Oh, thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Fatu Ture. Coming up on Care Fatu. As far as I'm concerned, 
we, there has been a change in government, but not a system change. Change in government, but not a system change. Yes. Can you elaborate on that? In communication, connectivity is everything. We ensure that the links never sleep. Quantities and qualities, all in our data service, providing efficient, reliable voice and data service. We believe if you're not up to speed, then you're going backwards. Communications have to flow as fast as the speed of light. Whatever business you're in, having someone who understands your needs is critical. That is why we just don't offer you technology, we offer you solutions. Enjoy Gumsel's internet broadband anytime, anywhere. Your national operator, Gumsel, Yaibarom. It's a great honor having you on the show. Actually, we had an interview some time ago on on the platform and the, the reaction has been really great. Uh, people wanted to have people like you um, come on the platform, uh, it will be great to talk to you on our main show uh, tonight. Okay, thank you. Uh, in fact, that is good. Uh, regardless of the distance that uh, we have between us, uh, if we are able to engage Gambians from afar, I think we can be able to uh, help each other out to get our needs and grow politically, economically, and socially. Um, so, so, so tell us first, what's, um, let's, let's have a, um, a background as to who Dr. Conte is. Where are you from? Uh, give us a little background, uh, your educational background as well, and uh, how long have you been away in the, from the country? <laughs> that would be interesting to Yeah, know. yeah. I was born in a small town called Pirang. Uh, some folks say Pirang Berende. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to Farwa Banta Primary School. My father was from Farwa Banta, and my mother was from Jansi Kundar Berende. I attended Farwa Banta Primary School. Went to St. Augustine's uh, High School and uh, graduated and left over 30 years ago to go to the United States, purposely to go to school. And fortunately, I was able to uh, uh, graduate with a bachelor's degree in accounting, master's in accounting, and a doctoral degree in accounting. And uh, correction, I teach at uh, Southwest uh, Minnesota State University, which is about a uh, two and a half hour drive from uh, uh, Minneapolis St. Paul, we call it this, uh, the Twin City or the cities in uh, Minnesota. Wow, that's what, 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 a, what a fine CV, Doctor. So, um, 30 years ago you left this country and you went to uh, look for a greener pasture, of course, mainly to study in the U.S. And um, for the past 30 years though, have you been looking at what is happening in the country? Yes, I left Gambia uh, for my political activities. Uh, we were all part of NCP, and uh, after the election, we knew how tough it was. And given the opportunity to go to the West was a great uh, achievement. And then uh, within a few years again, uh, the Gambia turned to a dictatorship, and uh, we actually, I'm not the only one, so many Gambians who uh, voiced, their, uh, uh, voiced their sentiments against the dictatorship. And uh, we have now a new dispensation, but as far as I'm concerned, we, there has been a change in government, but not a system change. A change in government, but not a system change. Yes. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, because uh, nothing to me has improved in the Gambia. From my own perspective, uh, talking to Gambians, whether ordinary Gambian civil servants and even uh, the security forces, I'm very much concerned about crime rate, our social network, and the opportunity of Gambians to be able to be their own entrepreneurs. Uh, that's a concern to me, and uh, uh, I wish we have a government that's willing to listen, that's willing to talk, engage Gambians, but it seems like uh, we as Gambians, we are slaves in our own country, because foreigners, actually non-Gambians, have more uh, wherewithal than the rest of Gambians. You cannot grow uh, an economy of a country when the brains of your country, who are indigenous Gambians, who are going to invest and their money is going to stay here in this country. 
and you are not given them the opportunity to grow. And that has been a very concern to me and up to to this day. Every time I talk to Gambians, that has been the, uh, crying for them. And I hope this government can look into that to give Gambians the opportunity to, uh, to invest even in the building materials. Because if you go to the Gimbeck section or the Caraba Avenue, you go to most of those shops, they are all owned by Gambians. And Gambians actually are uh, servants in their own country, particularly when you go to those shops and you see how Gambians are out there are trying to struggle to make a day's ends meet when you know that most of these uh, non-Gambians uh, every single month, or someone even said to me every month, they remit money to their home countries. But yet still, a person like you as a Gambian, you could have stayed where in London or anywhere else to be with us, but you decided to come back home to do something that very few of us can do. And I commend you for that. But I hope this government can give opportunity to the Gambians, uh, encourage banks to loan, lend Gambians so the Gambians can be their own entrepreneurs in their own country. But now what I'm seeing here is that non-Gambians control the economy of our country and it's a big concern to me. So we'll, we'll come to the economy, but first let's start with um, your visit. Um, you, were, you, 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 you went here for a couple of weeks and you, you, you're about to start a project. I'm sure it's because the environment has been very conducive. That's why you have decided to come home and invest in your country. Um, would, you, would it be fair to say that um, you know, the way the government is um, operating things is not encouraging, but you are coming to invest? No, and, I let, and let's talk about your project as well. Yeah, go ahead. I won't, I won't give credit to Barrow and his government for that, even if Jame was here. I would have done the same thing. Everything is about timing. Okay. And, but do you know that even to Gambia is number what, 185 out of 195 countries in doing business? And what, you, what I had to go through and what so many Gambians had to go through to set up a business. So nothing has changed. We had a change in government, but we did not have a change in system. We need a system change, just like Halifa said. We need a system change, just like Khalifa said, and um, uh, people will argue that might take time, uh, considering what this government has taken over, 22 years of um, former regime, it's going to be difficult to just clear all of that in two years. Would you agree that uh, the government um, have started working on the reforms, for example, uh, the security sector reforms have started. They have worked on the policy program. They're working on implementing that. They have started um, working on the civil service reforms. They have started uh, the CRC processes going. The commissions of inquiry and uh, truth commission are also ongoing. These are the major reforms that Gambian look up to for, for the government to implement. And most of these are on course. They have started working on them. I think that's fallacy. It's a dream. It's a dream? Yeah. How? I believe that uh, uh, they just talk, but they don't do the work. In my view, Barrow came as a caretaker person. He shouldn't be looking at long-term structural developments of our country. We, they agreed on to a three-year term, and I think he should oblige to. But I'm glad that you talked about, about some of those uh, uh, policies that they are going to try to have. I'm wondering what happened to the think tank uh, uh, organization that they set up when they first came. That was implemented by the vice president. It seems like this government chooses what it wants, and once it starts doing it, it cannot do it, it, it abandons it. You're talking about security. I'm so concerned because I went through Fajara, and I was deeply frightened to see an economic force at this tower with a, with a gun pointing to our depot, to our, police, to our army officials. And the other day I was at, uh, at uh, this place, uh, Westfield. Uh, the comic forces came down there and they actually rudely drove the taxi drivers from the road. Gambian police officers were standing with their hands like that. I went in and shook hands with them. And I said, well, I thought if we have economic forces in the Gambia, they should be at our border. But when it comes to the internal affairs of our country, our policemen should be in charge. 
So these people are driving around town with their guns, sitting like that, almost in sandwich. But together. then the, 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 the economic forces also, uh, they protect the presidency. So that might just give them some leverage while they are also in the streets. Because when the president is traveling, they are always there to sweep the road, they are at the state house, or, or if the force family is out. So I think also that gives them some leverage to be in, in the society as well. Absolutely. They are here to protect the Gambian people and the presidency. I think you are. Then we are underrating our Gambian security forces. No, you, no, 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 no. I yes? think it's, it's, it's what it's what we sign up for. No, no. Well, what 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 I don't understand, the Gambian police, the paramilitary. Are you telling me that they are incapable of protecting Barrow? But we have to have foreign forces that protect Barrow, and our own citizens who are born and bred in this country. Doctor, but I think also some of these things, they are very, they are very serious security um, issues. Because, for example, I think this all happened because Jame did not want to leave, and Eko, you know, and Eko was deemed it necessary to bring Ekomik uh, to be able to help get him out and also secure the country for that period because there was some security risk. So until their mandate ends, it's not until their mandate ends. The economic will be here, and when they're here, it's not because we underrate our security forces, but I think it's because they have a mandate to be here. I think it's important to note that because, in as much as we want economic to be here, we love our security operatives, but once they have mandate to be here, they're just going to be here. I think it's important to 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 make that known so that the, uh, the security force don't feel like. Um, um, somebody doesn't like them or they're not doing a job, but it's because these people have to be here and that's why they're here. But once their mandate elapses, they're going to go and we're going to continue normal businesses with our security forces. So, so are you saying that once we have the economic forces here, the Gambian security forces who are Gambians, they're both, and they have every right, that this government doesn't trust them it seems like we have a circle. No. No, we have three we have three circles. Mm -hmm. Within Barrow's inner circle is guarded by a foreign force. And out of the circumference also, they are guarded by foreign forces. And the outer side of the circle is guarded by Gambians. So which means that we don't trust our own selves. So this is why Gambia cannot move forward. I mean, how many, it's been over two and a half years since Barrow came to power. When would he give chance, the opportunity to get the security forces to be at the prime center of protection rather than foreign forces? In my view, I believe we should give the opportunity and the trust to Gambian civil, to Gambian uh, security forces to guard Barrow, but not the other way around. It's an insult to our, our, our brains, our capability. The trainings that we have, as a matter of fact, what I don't understand here is this. The military uh, is even trained by non-English speaking people. If English is our official language, we should be trained, they should be training people who, English speaking people should be training English speaking uh, for uh, 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 military, but not the other way around. So it does seems, that really matter as long it, as... Oh, it does matter to me in my view because here we have a country where our security is in jeopardy because even when it comes to electricity... But doctor, you just, you just confirmed that our security is in jeopardy mm -hmm. and they're trying to implement the security sector reforms. And one thing I also know that the, the, army, the army is working in collaboration with ACOMIC. They're not, working not, in collaboration. Not with the army folks that I talk to. They, yes, we have security problems. They are working in collaboration. Yes, we may have security problems, but not 100% of our security forces is anti-Gambia. What is happening how in our country now is that Barrow and his government trust, they trust foreign forces than our own. And I think we should begin to have debate on it. Go to Fajara and you will see how it is. Even if when even when you talk to an average Gambian, people have no respect for our security forces. I say, but that was on the Yaya Jame. It's been over almost thirty months. But that's not the government's problem. People's lack of uh, lack of respect for the security. No, forces. because when you have a president who doesn't talk about anything, he doesn't conversate with the people to know what is going on in our country, then how can you empower our security forces? The president, the box stops at the presidency, the president doesn't talk, therefore everything is going to be in jeopardy 
with respect to respect to what? Our security forces. I believe if this president comes out and engages the Gambian people, there will be a different perspective. That is my view. I'm Gambian 100%, but I will not second guess a Gambian to my security. Uh, uh, I will not do that because that is what is happening. It is, if you go out there and do a non-scientific survey on Gambia security forces, you're going to hear, I have been going around listening and even driving, going out there. Even when I was going to uh, Kaolak, a Gambian, a Gambian security forces standing in the rain and not even uh, umbrella and so forth. I say, oh my God. So here we have our own citizens who are going out there and they are even making the the minimal payment. You know, Gambia sometimes I sit down and say, you know, some of us are fortunate to be out there, to have the opportunity to be in a foreign country, to do whatever we want to do. But here, most of our people, their hands are tied. And that is why I encourage every, uh, any, any Gambian who is in diaspora, when we write on Facebook, please come down and do a visit. I respect your team here. In fact, I was praising them. I say, oh, Gambian. Gambians doing A, B, C, D, and E. We never thought it would happen, but Gambians are doing it. And I hope Barrow and his government can also give the security forces their, their right obligation to guard him. I don't support this idea of Barrow giving state hard uh, 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 stuff to economic forces and leaving our Gambian security forces in the wilderness. Yeah, Gambia did that. Some of the folks who had guns were from customers. Gambian Folks who were in the military never had those guns. Barrow has replicated the same. So if you talk to an average security person in the Gambia, they are dissatisfied with what is going on in our country. Mistakes happen. Yaya Jame is not coming back. But we need to try to empower our military. If we cannot do that, we're going to have a dysfunctional military. And I think that's what we have. And I think empowering the military means giving them all the necessary support. The military's budget today is over 800 million. That's a chunk of our budget. That only shows the commitment towards the military security service. And of course, you know, the security service reforms have been set up. What that entails is to retrain and, and give, a, give us a professional army. And so we have shown that Gambians have a confidence in their military. The Gambians have confidence in the army, and I think um, it's just going to take us some time uh, for us to sort our security issues out, but I think we are in the right direction, doc Doctor. So moving forward from security, mm -hmm. um, I know you are here, you have a project. Let's talk about that project before we look at the economy as well. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about your project that you're setting up in the Gambia. Well, first and foremost, I want to say that uh, I'm an educator, and I have been very concerned about the pass rates of Gambian 12th graders in English and math. Mm -hmm. uh, for the few past few years, it's been about what five percent of Gambians pass English or math, you know. So, which means that ninety-five percent of Gambian kids who took the twelfth grade examination either fail English or math. And I have been writing, criticizing the government. I say, well, if I criticize, I should be part of a solution. Mm -hmm. And being part of a solution is to go out there, uh, spend your money. So we decided to set up. Uh, a school, this is a remedial school, which is English, Math, and Accounting Remedial Education or Association. So we believe that we cannot uh, afford to see a uh, passage rate of Gambians in English and Math at 5%, and every time we see it, we talk about it, and we let it go. So I, I said I want to be part of a solution, but unfortunately this year, uh, again, incompetency in the Ministry of Education, uh, that the YAC results just came out last week. And the private examination that's going to be taken in English and math is uh, if, uh, May 6th and 7th, respectively. Mm -hmm. So if you have a child who fails English or math, will have insufficient time to prepare as a private candidate to take the exam. So we have a long way to go. But I believe in collaboration with some Gambians uh, here who are willing to help me, I'm looking at Long term, I'm not, I'm not looking at short term, you know, maybe we can help. If we can say that at least 25% of our kids who took English and math pass, that's well above the passage rate of 5% uh, of Gambians. We have to remember English is our official language. Uh, but now it is so sad, you know, that uh, even the simple English that we were taught in, in high schools in the Gambia is not the same now. What can we do as Gambians? So as an educator, I believe that I should invest in education to help. 
Gambians to help myself because if we can have more people who can pass English, there's an opportunity that they can pass other subjects. Mm -hmm. And not only that, after you know school, they can effectively communicate in English. And that's a possibility because research has shown that when uh, manufacturing companies went to Central America and Latin America, now they are now in uh, Asia, they are saying that it's a possibility that they may come to Africa. And there's certainty that, that it will. But if we don't have an educated society, educated you know, system in our country, how will we be able to recruit companies to come down here? And if we do that, our economy will grow. So that is my interest. I know it's, it's a risk, but it's a risk that I'm willing to take because if I can see that at least 10 to 20 percent of Gambian kids who entered my school pass English and math, I think that will be a tremendous achievement. What's the timeline for having the school operational? It is operational now, but oh. what I said, you know, I'm putting my credibility on the line. Ah. I told the guys who are running the school, we are not going to admit any Gambian, knowing that they're going to take the exam on September 6th. I don't want anybody's money because I'm not here to make money. I'm here to ensure. What do you mean if you say we are not going to admit any Gambian? We are not going to admit any Gambian to take for an exam on the 6th of September. Oh, okay. All right. Come on. I mean, th three weeks of yeah. instruction. No, that is that, that's, There is no way that a child who fails English or math can come in. In three weeks and pass. In three weeks, three weeks and pass. Yeah. I don't want to be part of it. Okay. So I said I would rather lose money, mm -hmm. but wait until the time is right for, ki for, for kids to come in. And someone suggested, you know what, maybe you also need to look at 10th. 11th and 12th graders because there is no statistical differences uh, between 10th grade English, 10th grade, 12th grade mm -hmm. English. Yeah. And there is no difference whether someone study, studies uh, 10th grade math and 12th grade math. So we are looking at the long term and I hope more Gambians can do that. I believe that if we have more competition quality will increase. So who, who, what, who, from what age do you admit uh, students? Is it only people who fail English and maths, or is it just, um, who exactly do you admit? At we are looking at 10th graders to 12th graders. 10th graders to 12th graders? Yes. Okay. And it's not, that, that means it's not going to be full-time, right? No. Because they will be in school as well. Because we are looking at, you see, the passage rate in English and math mm -hmm. is so low yeah. that you have to look at something that you know is a concern. So my concern here is English and math. So if parents are willing to spend some money, which extra is not, money, extra yeah. money mm -hmm. for remedial education, I think. They, and then the class size will only be 16. I refuse to have more than 16 students in the classroom. Wow. Because I believe that the smaller the class size is, the better or the, the, the possibility of increasing the quality of delivery and also acts on learning. You know, I'm going to try to bring the American system of education because I do not believe in this holistic learning system that we have in the, in the Gambia. I don't even believe that we should even have this great system. I think we should go back to the primary school and the secondary school system that we had before. Why do you think so many students are failing though? Why, especially in maths and in, in English? Well, because uh, on the, on the Yaya Jame, he brought more quantity uh, of schools and quality went down. I can summarize this, in, I can give a summary of why we fail. Mm. Number one, uh, why would you get a child to study nine subjects? So if quantity, if, if you increase quantity, it's going to affect quality. I looked at a grade for, for a young guy, I'm not going to reveal his last name because there are two last names. I think it was a Toure. <laughs> Not a Toure, Conte. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 really, really. <laughs> one, one, got, one got eight A's. Uh -huh, that's a Toure. The second one? No, the, the one with the eight A's. Another one, same. It's Conte. No, Toure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right? But this Toure young guy also had additional class, meaning nine, 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 credit, nine courses. Got to be. Hmm. So I'm looking at the quantity. You have number of classes that subject this person took. So the person who took eight had eight A's. This one who took nine, nine. courses had eight A's and one B. So if we have to average, we have to say that the one with eight, uh, uh, eight A's did, uh, uh, has a higher score compared to the one who did nine. But I know that you are smiling 
They are all tourists. They are all tourists, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so but what is, what is your school going to do differently? Because I know the education system, like you and everyone, has concerns about um, the quality and also the teaching, the people that are going to be teaching the students, and also even the model of how we teach these students. Because, um, you know, just like you said, you know, it's more of quantity, qu quantity than quality. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do differently at your school to make sure that students are giving the, the, the better opportunity to be able to pass? I would like to know how Nusrat, how, why, how, why is it that every single year Nusrat is always at the top? What are they doing that other schools are not doing? Nusrat. I really want to do research and I engage them and say, but what are you doing that other schools are not, are not doing? And if is, we, is Nusrat having better results when it comes to math and English than any other school? I know for math, mm -hmm. they do always come first. Oh, wow. You can go all the way back to... 1978. Hmm. What do you think? Why, 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 why? I have no idea. But I remember a friend telling me, who told me that uh, their principal, who was from Pakistan, Mr. said Boy. that math oh. was introduced wrongly in the Gambia. But there is something that New Strat is doing that if other schools can copy, I think our math passage rate will increase. But there is no excuse for us to be English speaking only to have 5% of our kids pass English. I think passage rate should be at least 90%. Is it the teaching mode? Is it the teachers? No, I don't want to blame, I don't want to blame the teacher because it seems I'm an educator, I may be biased on that. But I think it's a longevity. The reason why I'm saying it's longevity, I would like for someone to give me a research on kids who went from grades one to six, their exam score, I want to be able to compare those with kids who went from 7th grade to ninth grade. I want you also to compare kids who went from 10th grade to uh, 12th grade. You see, kids from grades 1 to 6 normally would spend 6 years of interaction with a teacher. Unfortunately for us in the Gambia, you have kids going into upper basic, they only would spend 3 years. Someone told me it's two and a half because the other six months the kids would, they, they were out there preparing to take uh, the 10th uh, uh, grade examination. So if you can say that a child can go to school for six years and that child has to interact with this teacher for six years, but then when they get to upper basic, you are telling the child you can only interact with, with the teacher and the principal for only three years, I believe that it affects quality of learning because you are moving the child from one environment to another environment. And we, we have not looked at the variables that contribute to success in learning. Even if we don't even look at the child's background, their family background, but when they just go out there and dissect our education system into three systems, three layers, meaning lower basic, upper basic, and secondary, I believe, I'm, I haven't done any research, but I, I'm, I'm suspecting that probably has contributed to the failure rate of our 12th graders. And in fact, no one has any uh, uh, data on the passage rate of 9th graders, and I bet it's even worse than the 12th graders' uh, scores. So what, should, what, what in, your, in, your, in, your, in your opinion, what should we do to enhance I mean, opening just one school is not going to be the solution. What should we do as a government, as a people, as a country? Because education is not just about school, it's about homes as well. What should we do as a people to increase um, the, 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 the percentage of students passing? Because like you said, the last results were not really good. Well, we need to, we need to break the education system into the... the uh, to, into two, to two layers instead of three, meaning kids will spend six years uh, from, even if they say grades one to six, but from grade seven to 12. Mm. And we should stop this idea of passing kids, moving kids from one grade to another, even if they fail. Yeah. So when we do that, it's going to affect the long-term success rate. And basically that's what's happening. And this government has seen this. So we blame Yaya Jammeh. I said, okay, you, we blamed Yaya Jammeh from 1994 to 2016, but then 2017 exam score, scores should be our responsibility. No, 
I mean, the effects of what happened 22 years ago, having, having hundreds of schools registered without proper registration, without proper teachers, and all of that will be the effect of our education system for a long time, doctor. Well, look, well how, come, how come Barrow doesn't even have education advisor? He has advisors on every aspect of our governance or policy, but he has no presidential advisor for education. But he has policy advisors. What policy, but policy advisors have no clue on education. So if he can decide to say that we have advisor for youth, we have advisor for religion, we have advisor for A, B, C, D, and E, but when he comes to education, no, so therefore, no, 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 doctor. No, no, so no, when no. it comes to let me let me just come here. When it comes to departments like education, tourism, and others, you have the technocrats at the ministry. These are the people who advise the president. But that, when that, you have the minister who is more of a ceremonial minister, ministerial positions are ceremonial. But you have the permanent secretary, deputy permanent secretaries. Sometimes in education, you have one or two permanent secretaries. These are the technicians and the director rates of this, the directors under those ministries. Ministry, ministry. They are, these are the advisors of the president. So, these are the technocrats who worked on the policies to advise me. the president. Did he say we have two permanent secretaries for education? Sometimes. I'm, I cannot confirm that, but I'm saying we, we have a higher education and a lower edu um, basic education ministry. So do, we need, do we even need that? I think we only need one ministry of education. Well, that's what we have. We have so that is, that is why, you see, we believed in this quantity. We believe in this quantity as opposed to quality. I believe that if we do have two layers of uh, education, grades 1 to 6, 7 to 12, I think longevity of learning, interacting with the teacher, administrators, probably will enhance learning. But when you are shifting a child, after two and a half years of engaging a teacher, and then you moving that child to another layer, in my view, as an educator, I believe that output will be poor. And basically, that's what we have. And again, again, uh, having two sets of ministries of education, to me, is ill-advised. I think we should have only one ministry of education. And basically, this has been the problem. And what I don't understand is this. So we we've, we've been blaming we've been blaming blaming Jame from 1994 to 2016, but when we came, we were all happy, clapping, laughing, and say we have a new president. I think Barrow should have taken the lead to ensure that our education system, particularly our 12th grade examination pass rate, increases. But every single year, when the results come out, we are at this three percent threshold, where you may have 6.5 percent of male students passing and female students only maybe 3.5 so if you add all of them together it's 10 percent if your average is five percent i think any responsible minister of course if i was the president i'll fire the minister of education basic education because there is no way that i can sit down continuously and seeing the same rate happening without uh sacking that minister and say, put someone in there, even someone in the classroom to be a minister. So when that happens, this small rate of passage rate, to me has affected the quality of delivery, even at the civil service level. Because this is sad. Last year when I was here, I was a nurse, and a, a parent was so upset, I even had to intervene to say to the parent that it's not your child's fault, it's the system's fault. Like I said, we had a change in government but we do not have a change in the system, and we need a system change in the Gambia. So um, let's look at the, the university. I know the government has announced they're also changing, they're upgrading GTTI to a, to a university level. This will give access to more Gambians to be able to, to have a university education. What is your opinion on that? I know that uh, I welcome that idea. Hmm. Because we have this British mentality, this British system of elimination. We are the best can go and get college education. But we have forgotten about our technical aspect of development. Mm -hmm. When I see Gambians now doing stuff that we never thought of, where we even had to take our cars to Senegal to even paint. Now Gambians are doing all those uh, kind of metal work. So I believe that, you see, if you, do, if you have a technical degree or you do a technical job, 
when you go to a bank, does it say that you're doing a technical job? No. And by the way, let me just say this here. There is a university in Virginia called Virginia Institute of Poly Virginia Polytechnic Institute, uh, Technical University called VIP, meaning Virginia Tech. Mm -hmm. They now even have a medical school. They graduate students with PhD in economics, accounting, you name it. So what we have here, we had before, I welcome the government. And I know some people uh, do not agree that yeah. GTTI should be turned to a university, but I believe GTTI and MDI should be turned to a university. And even if they say University of the Gambia, and say the location of GTTI, if it is in Joshua, say Joshua. Joshua come and then And then you say uh, University of the Gambia. As a matter of fact, I, don't, I looked at the curriculum of uh, MDI, mm -hmm. I looked at looking at the accounting curriculum, not other curriculum. Mm -hmm. I looked at the curriculum of MDI and looked at the curriculum of uh, UTG. To me, uh, MDI has the best. So I believe that they can integrate together as one university because they are also uh, next to uh, each other. So yeah, I applaud the government for trying to convert. Uh, but it should go through legislature. Baro cannot dictate to us what he wants. I think it should be debated in parliament. We should not give this man the uh, absolute power to decide to, to decide what he wants. I think it should be debated in Parliament so that Gambian citizens can hear what has to be done for our country. But when you have one uh, policy statement coming from the President that I want to make this and no one can counter that because we are looking at cost. We also are looking at the capability of Gambians who are willing, who can teach at those institutions. So we can, we can do that by collaborating with each other and try to get ideas from each other. But when we try to be centered in a way that the president has absolute power, then it becomes a nightmare for economic and social development. So we'll take our first commercial break. When we come back, we'll look at the economy. I know doctor is one person who is very, very much passionate about our economy. I do not agree with him on a lot of the things that he, he, he says when it comes to the economy. But when we come back, we'll look at that and, and some other things. We'll take our first commercial break. Coming up on Care Far Too. They said the economy grew by 4 to 6%, but inflation rate was higher than the economic growth. So therefore, Gambia's economic growth, to me, in my view, if you put a positive and a negative together, and the negative is higher than the positive, then it becomes a negative. Mm -hmm. So to me, Gambia's economy has not grown. <laughs> Sampa, <laughs> Wow, <laughs> 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 Desordre, ça a Lumu got 
Dreaming of owning a property in a prime location with great proximity and fantastic neighborhood? EJ Investments Sanyang Seaview Estate is the best choice you have been waiting for. Our Sanyang Seaview Estate is approximately 15 minutes drive away from the busy hop of Brusubi roundabout and into the heart of nature where you can have a peaceful and relaxed lifestyle with your family. You can buy a finished four bedroom story with five year flexible payment plan or a service plot with two year payment plan option. With over 300 homes, you will enjoy big tar roads with covered drainage, modern electrification with solar street lights, gated entrance with security posts, and a breath-catching experience of our beautiful sea view and lake view. You can own a home today at our Sanyang Sea View Estate. Call us today on 446-4838 or 325 9220. Visit our website on ejinvestments.net. EJ Investments, first in property. Faites-le pour voir où galasse qui peut quoi ramener deux millions minga à New Fidéka. Vous faites que ne chez Atmi, ça compte comme Wesuna n'yar fuka à n'yenti June Dallasi. Bête ouvert bonneka, dinga amluto lo si n'yar June Dallasi. Lempo silangurgi de soukande kungi ligue yokute reumi. G R E moi banhas bunguri Gambia sas. Ngir mu faye ku lepolu lempo chibi reumi. Bête achna G R E di yegal faye kati lempo ine. Warugala pour New Fay l'unionan withholding tax on contract payment. Ma nam bepa contract bu way joxe te ci bi rew mi lañu tokkon xaliss contract bi ngeen nangoto war nga ci wañi ci xayma témer bu neka fuka bu féké né contract bi dekku ci bi rew mi bu boba di nga waro wañi témer bu neka fuka ak jurom li moy lempo bu ñu nan with holding tax on contract payment li moy lempo bi nga xamné yow mi joxe contract waru gal la nga wol batiku dem fey ko ci makani jiaré tax office bu la gëna jégé mbété ci banque yi jiaré jagléel pour fey war nga djebal lempo bi ci diri fuki fan ak jurom ganaw bi nga wagné ci xali ci contract every young gambian dream of a university degree he wants a good paying job after graduation a pretty wife and ultimately own a dream home what if i can't afford my desired dream home and that is why you need to visit Universal Properties. We specialize in customer satisfaction. We listen to every of our clients' needs when we sold the properties to our client. Before you know it, you hear the client saying, I like this house. This is the room that cuts my heart. And most of the time, they cling to the door never to let go. Most clients want to close the deal right there. And that is why we always have their contracts in the trunk of our cars. We work at our client's pace. No haggle, no hazard. We're waiting for you at our office in Kairaba Avenue here in the Gambia. Have you run out of cash power? Do you want to transfer funds to your family? Or do you want salary advance without coming to the bank? Your banking services have just been brought to you on your mobile phone. Download and install from your App Store or Google Play Trust Bank's mobile app. Simply search for TBL Mobile App and follow the instructions. You can access the following services. Funds transfer, cash power purchase, forex rates inquiries, mobile airtime top-up, mini statement, balance inquiry, TBL app. It's the only app that allows you to take salary advance and many more. You can also interact with your customers using our USSD code by dialing star 533 hash. At Trust Bank, we bring innovation that is useful to you, our valued customer. With our mobile app and USSD, banking is at your fingertips. Trust Bank Limited, proudly Gambian. Uh, welcome back to part two of this interview. Doctor, in the first, uh, uh, the first segment, we looked at the education. And we also looked at, I mean, what you're doing, the project you're doing in the Gambia. But I also want us to look at the, the economy, the state of our economy. Uh, what is your opinion about that? What is the state of our economy? Well, I have a very radical perspective on the economy of the Gambia. Uh, when Jame was in power, when Jame left, they say it was at zero. Hmm. So anything at zero even if you don't know anything about physics, you will know that it will grow. It has to grow. So they said the economy grew by 4 to 6%, but inflation rate was higher than the economic growth. So therefore, Gambia's economic growth, to me, in my view, 
If you put a positive and a negative together, and the negative is higher than the positive, then it becomes a negative. Mm -hmm. So to me, the Gambia's economy has not grown. And let me tell you one, let me give well, you. How? Let, well, if you go to most of the shops, uh, especially hardware stores, building materials, they are own, owned by non-Gambians. So, so most of these non-Gambians, they take their money out of the country. And when you go out to those shops, Gambians are literally beggars in their own in their own country. So you cannot grow an economy when you have a bank, and most of the foreign most of the banks here are owned by foreign foreign companies, foreign country, uh, well, foreign citizens. So Gambians in their own country do not have the opportunity to go to banks and get loans from banks. So how can your economy grow when your own citizens are not given the opportunity to go and get money? And you know that when those Gambians have money, money is going to stay here in the country. I can give you, tell you one uh, uh, mobile company that I was told remits over three million uh, U.S. dollars out of the country of the Gambia. So if we don't empower our citizens, how can one talk about economic growth? If we don't empower agriculture, how can we talk about economic growth? In the Gambia, we're supposed to be uh, sufficient in rice production. If we can produce 200 metric tons of rice, Gambia now only produces 50 metric tons. So therefore, how can our economy grow when we import more than what we export? And now you see that the Gambian dollar continues to devalue. The, the value of the Gambian dollar continues to decrease in value. So therefore, this US dollar that I have in my pocket is still the same. But if you look at the Gambian dollar, you have to surrender more Gambian dollars. In my view, the economy may have grown in the Gambia. But if you, if you negate that with the inflation, the Gambia's economy has not grown. And even if someone says that the Gambia's economy has grown, I want you to tell me, that Gambian business person, are you going to empower that Gambian business person? Even like you, you have a TV show. One day we would like for you to have a TV station. Can a bank give you a loan to say, Care Fatu is going to have a TV station? I, I mean, in any banking sector, even in the West, though, doctor, you have to bring collateral. You have to be able to... Uh, proof um, that you should be able to pay that loan anywhere in the world though for you to be able to have access to loans you should be able to provide guarantee either you know by sus the way what the kind of income that comes through your bank or some form of guarantee that is not just Gambia but again again when you have a government that is sleeping that is not taking care of its citizens no, that is no, not no, trying no, to but no no answer answer that position because that has nothing to do with a government sleeping it does have no some, no no it no, does, it does, no, because no, no. in the u.s if i want a loan in the u.s mm -hmm. even as if, if i want a loan in the u.s mm -hmm. even a simple overdraft mm -hmm. my bank my bank of america would be able to see that i have a current i have a, a salary that comes in every uh, friday mm -hmm. or i have a salary that comes in every two weeks mm -hmm. to be able to pay that but even a simple overdraft no, so if you want a loan they must see as your source of income not only or that. you must be able to provide some form of guarantee and that is the same in Gambia as well not only that they in 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 the u.s system you have what we call credit rating you even regardless of whether you make money if your credit is not good you're not going to get a loan yeah but what i'm saying our yes. cultures are different you see one thing about us educated people we believe that if we have this education, we are the smartest people on earth, but we tend to forget that culture is integral in our development. But then my, my point is what, 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 what should the government do to, to be able to make that uh, like accessible to loan f easy for people? Because you are saying it's, that is the government's fault. But, but if how foreigners is it are given the opportunity to get loans from, from the banks here, how come Gambians cannot get loans? It's because they're providing the security, doctor. What? That Okay. I mean, if what you go to the bank, if you go to the bank, it's not about whether you're a Gambian or you are a foreigner. It's about what you're putting out there. I talked to, I talked to several guys in the bank and asked them this question. Uh, since you are working here, can you do some form of uh, entrepreneurial activity and get a loan from the bank? They said the bank wouldn't give them loans. So um, again, um, I wish somebody can do that research. That research, but I believe, I believe Gambians are denied credit in their own country, but foreigners are given the opportunity I think to get loans that, that, is, that, that I think I, I would not agree with that statement because I've worked with banks and I know that as a, as a young Gambian, when I need a facility, as long as I'm able to provide security or as long as 
I'm able to provide source of my income that can show that I can pay for that facility, I'll be giving that facility. Well, maybe I know that that is available for but, every government. But maybe it is despite who you are, that is available. I mean, the bank, the, go the, go the government don't control how banks operate. Again, again. They don't, they, they don't again, operate their, again, their daily again, operations. Again, the policy of a government chances uh, entices economic growth. But when you have a government that cannot engage Gambians on those important issues, because you and I are talking and Gambians are listening, yeah. I have a different perspective to say that mm. uh, I trust Gambians, I will give credit to Gambians, I will give them the opportunity. Why can't the government even guarantee those loans to Gambians to start businesses, uh, whether it is in agriculture, any technical enterprising activity? But I'm saying that foreigners come in here, they are giving loans, and they prosper more than the average Gambian who is here in the Gambia, born in the Gambia, will die in the Gambia, will get buried in the Gambia. So if we don't empower our people, how can we have economic growth? I believe that we should empower people. Thank you. I believe that Gambians should be given the opportunity. And I've always said this, especially when it comes to um, uh, investors coming in, the government giving them tax breaks, while small businesses like ours are not considered for those. I definitely agree on that. But one thing I also am very mindful of is we have over we have thousands of Gambians in the diaspora who are also in other countries, and they also want to be given equal opportunities in those countries. So if we want to look at Gambians in the country as just foreigners who are coming here, I mean, I think the government should put up policies where when foreign investors come here, a percentage of their investment should be invested in the communities that they work in. For example, if you have somebody mining a site in Mandina, in Mandina Ring, at least for that company, 15% or 10% should be invested in that community. I am for that. But to say that foreigners come here and they and they prosper, they give them loans and everything, I think it's because if it's the businesses they, 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 they invest in, in the country and how they run their business. For example, if I'm running Kirfato and I'm, I'm not running it properly, I am running it, I am using the business money to take care of myself, to take care of my house and to pay the bills, how is this business going to grow? Sometimes this is some of the ways how, the, some of the reasons why some of our local businesses don't grow. It's the management of our businesses as well, Doctor. Okay. Again, that also has to do with engaging Gambians, but I'm, I'm glad that you talked about uh, uh, diaspora Gambians. Yeah. I wish this government would take into consideration that a diaspora Gambian who wants to invest with a minimum of the 25,000 can be given credit. But we come down here, try to set businesses, and it sounds like uh, we are fighting against enemies who are pointing their guns to us. So if this government can put into practice whereby diaspora Gambians can be given tax credits to start businesses, I think it will have a domino effect on the growth of uh, on our economic growth, yeah. but Gambians in diaspora wanna invest. I was just telling someone, you know, I was passing um, uh, the Radfield uh, farm somewhere in Sukuta, and I asked the gentleman, you know, uh, do you all have boreholes and so forth? He told me, and I saw the corn growing up and so forth. Now going to Combo East, uh, driving through Madina Bar and Jiboro and uh, uh, Niji, uh, then Umorto and so forth, and seeing no rain and our people planting and their crops are dying and so forth, I was just wondering if, say, 20, 30, 40, 50 Gambians are willing to go into agriculture to get support from the Gambia and use boreholes to grow stuff, even gardening and so forth, because this government artificially inflated inflated the denominator to decrease the debt to GDP, where they did not make any substantive audit to verify the reliability of the information that they gave. So what I'm saying, you know, is that we in diaspora, we love our country, but all we are asking for the government of the Gambia to give us opportunity 
to come here and invest but to give us credit. Yeah. Because if we come and we hire three Gambians, three, three or four, five Gambians, we are increasing the productivity of our country. But when you come down here, even the ease of doing business, it seems like you are fighting uh, a war and we should be able to find avenues. Any diaspora government coming in here, say a minimum of 25,000 US dollars or British pound sterling, I think it will in, uh, improve economic growth. As a child who was born in the provinces, to go into the village and see no one doing farming, and now anywhere you go, everybody wants to buy a bag of rice from a shop. Mm -hmm. I think in the long run, we are going to have food security problems. And this government is not addressing that. But I believe if diaspora Gambians are given the opportunity to even concentrate on agriculture, particularly those areas in Bansang and going all the way to Koina, where they have fresh water, I think Gambia's rice production can increase from 57 metric tons to at least 100. Then we would be able to say that uh, uh, we're going to import less rice, thereby uh, uh, enabling the Gambian currency to increase. Again, I'm going to put apples and oranges together with the introduction of the new Gambian dollar. I was dumbfounded to say, oh my God, if you are going to go into new currency by the West African uh, economic community, yeah. why would you print a new note? Print a new note. Yeah. And I'm making a prediction that the Gambian dollar is going to devalue by April of 2020 at least by 10%. Why? Because when you have more quantity, price goes down. So if we have all these old notes in circulation and you're going to bring new notes in circulation, what is going to happen to the value of the Gambian dollar relative to foreign currency? The Gambian dollar is going to devalue tremendously. And I'm making a prediction that the Gambian dollar is going to go down by 10%. But wow. again, I mix apples and oranges. You see, we educators sometimes confuse the audience. When we talk, we just mix everything up. But yeah. I thought maybe you would have some question on that. <laughs> so, so I was going to come to the, the, the echo. Do you think that is... Um, I, someone said to me, um, Gambia joining the ECHO is not, is not profitable to us as a country. It's the bigger, um, eco, bigger, um, bigger economies like, um, like Nigeria and, and Senegal maybe will benefit more and smaller economies like us will just be there but there wouldn't be enough uh, benefit for us. Is that true? I disagree. You disagree. And I can also tell you francophone. Mm -hmm. We'll always do what France tells them to do. Francophone is not going to follow join, or join us. But I welcome the, the idea of ECOWAS. Let me just, we're talking about comparative advantage mm -hmm. of nations. I don't know whether you read Michael Porter's book on comparative advantage. No. We in West Africa, we should be able to say this. Let's identify countries that have abundance of whatever to produce those. Therefore, we can supplement our, we can decrease our, our, our dependence on importing rice from Asia. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Mano River, meaning Liberia, Sierra Leone, and, uh, and Guinea, mm -hmm. and Guinea, yes, indeed, yeah. they have abundance of fresh water. Mm -hmm. So chances are those areas will have more production of rice than if that's the case, Join having a single currency will help us. And I'm telling you, let anyone who says that Gambia will not benefit, we have the strongest currency. I don't know whether you know that yeah. in West Africa. In West Africa. In yeah. West Africa. Despite, despite our, our size, our currency, relative to surrendering our currency to other foreign countries, Gambia has the best. Ghana, on the other hand, guess what they did? They just dropped the zeros. Yeah. But if you add the zeros, because one Leon, I think, is 7,000. Uh, uh, one dollar is 7,000 Leon. Leon. And uh, in, I believe, Liberia, if it's not 169 or it's 69 uh, Liberian dollars. So the Gambia at 50 right now, even though it goes up to, it may go up to maybe 100. But again, I believe that if we have a single currency. Considering it, that our, 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 our currency is stronger than all of these countries, in West Africa, why would we? Why should we join the ECHO? Because I mean, their their monies are very, they 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 they're very low compared to to the U.S. dollar. Yeah, why, why would we that be advantageous to us? Because of uh, 
because then we can get is it because we can have a good access to trading access or yes indeed trade 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 we why do we have to go to west to buy stuff from west when we can buy it from our own this is why africa cannot develop and our total dependence on so-called our development partners that makes me sometimes about to cry to say that after 50 something years of independence we continue to depend on western countries i believe if we come together as nations the Ecowas nations, even English-speaking West Africa, we come and have one single currency, I think we're going to realize more economic growth than ever before. And then um, I, I, I'm thinking, would it be strategic if, um, for example, we're looking at agriculture? I know that this is the backbone of our country and, of course, it's not doing very well. The rainy season has not been good. That is the climate um, we should, as a government, we should uh, concentrate on looking at climate change issues more um, because I know people will say, let's pray to have more rains. Yes, that is our culture. But climate change is real. And also, for example, if we have investors coming into the country, would it be advisable to government to look at investors, for example, let's say, because we're trying to develop the agricultural sector, let's say, we say ag investors that are coming into the agricultural sector, we give you tax breaks, but we don't give tax breaks to just any investor. That way we have more people investing in a particular area that we are interested in development. But if we want to give tax breaks to every investor that just has money to come and invest, even if that area is not in the interest of the country, should we be strategic in giving tax breaks or should it be just open to any in international investor? Well, before, I, I think we should be strategic. Yeah. And also empower, encourage diaspora Gambians and Gambians here who have, who have the wherewithal of uh, investing in agriculture. I think if we do that, but there is no way we can grow. If we can grow if we don't have rain. Mm -hmm. I want to invite your attention to Cambodia. I don't know whether you went there. Yeah, I know Cambodia. Okay, you go to Cambodia now and you see what the Chinese are doing. You will cry. Trees that have been in existence for over 200 years have been cut down. I went to Umarto. The old man told me that someone came down to buy their tree. And what they were going to pay them was less and they were not going, they were not going to sell it. So I'm wondering, oh my God. So here you have a chief in Combo East. We have a governor. And we also have uh, a person who is responsible for the Brikama Area Council, that I think is dysfunctional. So someone can come to a village to cut down a tree that is over 200 years, and the government doesn't know anything about it. So when we talk about climate change, we also talk about deforestation, yeah. because what is happening in the Gambia is a nightmare. Go to Cambodia, you'll see it for yourself, and then you can affirm that the reason why we do not have tree, uh, rain Great. is because of the constant cutting of trees. Yeah. This is not by Allah's fault, this is by our own fault. Yeah. So if we can do, just take a visit to Cambodia and then you will affirm what I said. It's very, very disturbing. And this government is seeing it day in and day out and no one has said. And even the forest, as you pass Farato, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who actually gave the authority to so I cannot remember the gentleman's last name, but why were they cutting down all those trees? And as a matter of fact, do you know Baro has an estate? After you pass uh, Farato, you head headed towards Brikama. Look on your left, there is a road there. They went through, cut down all those trees, going by Landry Peters' uh, farm. You see a road going all the way out. So no one knew that here we have a president who has an estate over there. And he, had, he has authority to cut down on our trees, and no one has said anything about it. So if it doesn't rain, don't blame Gambians only. Blame our president, because we don't have any policy in place. I, I even just wonder why. Are they, can anyone tell me with seriousness that we have Ministry of Forestry? Yes, we do. Then why do we have all these trees that have been cut down in our country? I don't know. Okay. I mean, I'm, say, I'm, say, I'm saying that, you know, we will, con we will have food security problems, I'm telling you. Sometimes now you are even better to have a borehole. Go to Rat Ratville uh, Farm. Farms right here in Sukuta, and you see with no rain, yeah. 
Look at the size of the corn that they have over there. And I was just wondering, what is this road coming from? You come from Fajara, where, you know, uh, where the Bensuda's house is. As you are coming down, look at all those rice fields over there. I was just wondering, if this government is so smart in their head, if the Minister of Agriculture knows what she is doing, and we can, have, we can strategize to say that if we can have more boreholes in that place, do you know how much rice uh, production we will have even in the urban area? Yeah. And we can even have agriculture year-round if we're able to provide uh, basic boreholes to, 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 to gardens and, and farms. So I think that is one thing that the government should look into investing. So we all agree, we all agree on that. So when we criticize this government, it doesn't mean that we are anti-Gambia. We are saying that we want to find solutions to our country's problems because if we do not be careful, what is going to happen to Gambia is we will continue to have food security problems. We're going to have education security problems because if you look at only 5% of Gambian kids pass English and math. And if we continue to be in that, using that trend, Gambia will not be a nation whereby we can get foreign companies to come down here and set up manufacturing companies so that these young men and women who are out there in the Gambia can have the opportunity to be employed because these people are as smart as any child that you see in the Americas or Europe. Yeah, and, and one thing that a lot of us are concerned about, a lot of people are concerned about, um, that I would want to have your opinion also about on is the, the, the this three years Jatna protest that is, um, that is um, being planned by this group, the three years Jatna group, which is in December. Uh, a lot of people are concerned that this is our, this is in December, this is the tourist season for this country. And our economy depends mostly on the tourists. And, um, you know, when, when tourists have these um, travel advices, they will tell their, they, you know, countries, embassies will tell their people to abstain coming from the country, coming to the country. And this might affect our, our economy. Are you concerned that something like this, um, even though we all agree people have rights, when you, as a citizen, you have a right to protest, as a citizen, you have a right to go and show your anger or it will exercise whatever you want to say, say it. But also, um, some people have concern that in December, this is when, as a country, we, we a lot of tourists visit the country, and um, people are worried it might affect the economy. Are you worried about that? I'm not worried because I put more weight into ethics and morality. Sometimes it's good to suffer for a duration and to realize big at the end. I am fully behind the three-year Jodna because Barrow, no one put a gun on the Barrow's, on Barrow's head to agree that he, to resign from UDP, he voluntarily resigned and there is a tape on which Halifa spoke and Barrow spoke. And you see, I'm not a lawyer, but he says with the limited business law courses that I took, and contract law that I took, it says that a subsequent written contract, we're talking about parole evidence rule, cannot contradict a prior oral contract. But this was not signed. This was, ah, no, agreement no, no. was not signed. No, but it was implied. It was, listen, Barrow resigned from UDP to run as an independent a coalition uh, candidate. Mm -hmm. Therefore, whether it was signed or not, it was implied. And again, when we, you see, one thing about us educated people, we so-called educated people, we think that we are, more, we are smarter than the average person on the street. Back in the day, our parents, our grandparents, would swear on the Quran and the Bible that they would do A, B, C, D, and E. And they affirmed that. These people came to agreement. And now all of a sudden, some folks who even spoke to say that they're going to resign after three years are now the ones who are championing this five-year constitutional mandate. I think it is hypocritical for Barrow and the rest of folks who support the five-year 
uh, constitutional requirement at the sacrifice of the three year, uh, three, a three year term that Barrow, you know, Im implicitly, implicitly agreed to. But now they can use this so called uh, 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 intellectual or education uh, uh, thinking that the Constitution is uh, superior to our integrity and our moral values. Uh, that's where I want to come in, though, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Yes, this was something as a team that they agreed on. Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe the president should come out and address the nation mm -hmm. because definitely when he came, when he was campaigning, he campaigned on based on that agreement that he was going to serve for three years. Wow. But I still believe the majority of the people that he signed that agreement with I in for him to go for five years. Can I, you name them? OJ is in for five well, years. OJ, OJ, OJ speaks out of his mouth because OJ contradicted no, no, no. himself. OJ, no, no, in no, fact, he, recently, no, no, no. no listen, let me come. OJ let contradicted me. himself because OJ said, OJ, this is what OJ said, mm -hmm. that he was going to resign after three years. And then all of a sudden, he's going to change like a chameleon to say that it's five years. I, think, I find it so disingenuous that a person as a minister indicated that he would say three years and when he was fired or relieved of his duties, now going to call for five years. It is so hypocritical. Well, let me just finish what I was going to say. I believe most majority of the people that wanted Barrow to, uh, that agreed with him for him to start for five years, three years, majority of them are now in for the five years, number one. Number two. Did they receive the brown envelope? I don't know about any brown Thank envelope. Thank you. And secondly, let me come here. Secondly, um, the constitution that the president was sworn in by gives him the mandate to serve for five years. Yes, the president can, like Halifa said in his recent press conference, the president can resign if he wants to. The president can leave office and the vice president takes over if he wants to um, adhere to the agreement. But he is not bad. He's not, he's not, he's not, um, he's well. not he's, he cannot be forced to do it. It's only if he wants to do it. And if Barrow is telling us he wants to serve for five years and the Constitution gives him the mandate to five years, why don't we allow him to serve for five years? See, if Halifa was nominated as, a, uh, as our coalition candidate, yeah. I don't think we'll be in this nightmare because Halifa is a man of integrity. It seems like we have people who lack morality. Halifa actually said something that most, maybe Barrow and his folks are not aware of. Halifa just talked to them about morality. That if you agree to a policy, you should oblige that policy. But Barrow, remember, he said something that I thought was so sarcastic, well, was an insult to the, the, to the thinking of every Gambian. Mm -hmm. Whether we like it or not, he would say five years. I thought he just insulted all of us. In my view, I tend to believe that morality and ethics, they are more superior to me than this so-called educated constitution that we try to uh, talk about at our convenience. But I believe that if you agree on, on a policy, if you make a promise, you should always keep your promise. Back in the day when we were children, our parents were doing the same. But what happened now, we as educated people, we will always try to say, oh, wait a minute. The Constitution says this, so we should follow. So whatever you promise, you can lie. And that is what is happening in the Gambia. I'm saying that the Gambia as a country, our culture has changed. Maybe I left this country too long to have the same Gambian culture, but the Gambian culture that I grew up in would never have done such. And I believe if Halifa was nominated as a coalition candidate, Halifa probably would resign after his three-year mandate. And then you think the, the three years general protest should go ahead? You think? I do. I encourage them to do it because it's our constitutional right. You see, when Barrow say whatever you like it or not, Barrow was trying to test us. Before yes. we go further, I was going to end this interview, but Doctor, you have been, I think, um, you have been very, very, very much, um, um, act, you know, I don't know, you, you have called out people saying they, they have stolen from the government, they have built houses without evidence, Doctor. So, I, you know, when, when I interviewed you the other time, I was like, 
can you give us one proof? You, you know, you cannot just tell people you have stolen because you have seen them live in a mansion and without even knowing where the source of their money is and just because they work in government. Does it mean they steal from the government? And you don't even have any proof as to whether they're stealing from the government. But so, you have been constantly accusing people. And that is kind of not really un not fair from an educated well, they, person they like can, you. They can, they can sue me if they want to. No, because uh, they are public officers. But I think it's also on your side for you to also... But I'm a you, you, are, you are followed by so many people. Yeah. For your status, for somebody like you to accuse people without any evidence is ah. also not... As Very a, good. As a forensic accountant and a fraud examiner, I'm using my knowledge and rationalization, appraisal and opportunity to conceal a fraudulent act. I believe I just passed a building that looks like uh, someone as an advisor to the president who owns it. Uh, my friend, when Jame was in power, everybody said Jame was corrupt. Jame was taking money from us. Yes, I stand my ground that these people, you see, when you embezzle, it doesn't have to be cash only. You can't have improper conversion of non-asset item as part of your property. For instance, if you are a minister, uh, you can benefit by, by someone giving you bag of cement uh, or a building materials to build. Your, your, your stuff. And these are people who were actually uh, riding gale gales in this country. These were people who never had vehicles before. These were people who never even held any professional jobs in the West. And now within the duration of 24 months, these people are living, they are living beyond the means of their own support. So I challenge any of them to sue me in court but I will stand my ground as a fraud examiner to say yes, there is direct correlation of thievery by these government officials within the duration of the time they came to power and the time that I'm talking. I will continue to fight for the average Gambian because every single morning someone gets up in the Gambia without food to eat. I'm telling you, I put it to you again, that every single morning some family member worries about transporting their child to school. And I believe that from one location to another is eight dollars. And if your child has to make two transfers, it is sixteen dollars. And that child going back home again is another sixteen thirty two. I'm wondering the transportation costs and the stress level of these kids probably has contributed to has co contributed to their failure rate. So when I challenge these government officials of investment, I as a Gambian, as a Gambian, I will stand to say that they can sue me in court. I believe that the Gambian people deserve better. I believe Gambian kids need to be educated. But this self-enrichment, someone has to stand up and put their credibility online. You see, these people, we will not be able to know what they have until we set up another commission and that's when you're going to say, oh my God, I cannot believe. Because when Jame was in power, all that happened, a lot of people did not know until the commission, with all the revelations coming out. And now people were saying, oh my God, I can't believe. What we have in the Gambia today is animal farm. Get what you can before others can get. Oh, that is a serious allegation, doctor. I, well, I'm here. Like I, 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 like I said, they can... They can sue me if they want to. I'm a Gambian. I have every right to fight for every, every Gambian citizen. But what worries me is Gambians get up in the morning. They don't have any food to eat. Some of them, they cannot even eat lunch. A lot of folks go to bed hungry. And you have these Gambian kids, they cannot even get from point A to point B. And now you talk about the Gambian school teacher who has been teaching in the system for 20, 25 years, cannot even make $7,000. I will put my credibility to say to these government officials, even those ministers that I may not name today, but they are more corrupt than Yahya Jammeh if we put them together. 
Wow, uh, that is a serious allegation. Thank you. Well, Doctor, finally, before we go, we know you had political ambitions. I'm, I'm sure that is why you're so critical about the government. Mm -hmm. You're so critical with this uh, government. What is the status of that? Your political ambition, I know you had the party. What was the name of? Democratic Party. The Democratic Party that you're working on setting up. And, you know, you had a lot of heat on social media. It seems like you, you're abandoning that cause. Nope. So what is the status of the you Democratic see, Party? I'm from the village. Mm -hmm. When you go to the pond to, to fish or during the rainy season, you see the fish jumping and you go in the pond to swim and you have so many people coming in. Then you go to the corner and ponder. Is this for the Gambian people or is this for myself? Mm -hmm. A person who is in diaspora, yeah. Gambians don't know anything about me. Mm -hmm. I say, you know what, I'm going to get out. The ones that are in the pond, I'm looking down to say, can we all come together and one have one candidate against Barrow? And then we can go and come. So, but why the call for, I, I mean, I saw in your postings, even this morning I was going through your Facebook posting and you're, you're always advocating for a correlation against Barrow. What has Barrow done in these two years that warrants such a correlation? Well, we did a correlation in 2016 because Jame was seen as a dictator. Mm -hmm. And in two years, uh, Barrow has not gone to that level. You've why are you looking, why are you working, why are you constantly advocating for a coalition against him? The $34 million a question that the First Lady took from the Gambian people, the mansion that Barrow built in Mankamankunda, the building that Barrow just, <laughs> is, Barrow just has in Bakau. And the Fatimata building that I just went out there and say Fatimata Kodole and seven people came to fight me. You know a soldier cannot fight a war by himself. I was there by myself, the Toba showed. Where? And in Gambia? In, in, yes, in, in, is that somewhere in Carnifin? As you coming from, if you come, if you come from Banjul, you take the road to Bakau, the first uh, junction, you make a left and side. And you left said Fatima da Kodole? I said Fatima da Kodole. Seven people came to fight me. But you know, a soldier cannot fight a war by themselves. And some people advised me to go to the police. I said, no. I already said what I wanted to say. So the $34 million a question, Gambians talked about it. And a young lady said Fatima da Kodole, up to this time, we have not received the money. So is, was it fair for the first lady and her foundation, which I believe the first lady should not have any foundation, no sitting president should have a foundation. So I will fight for the Gambian people. But I think in, in defense, I'm not, in, I'm not here holding brief for anybody, mm -hmm. but I think uh, the Minister of Com Information has released a statement, um, has once said that this was not, in an interview said, this money was not um, given to the first lady. In fact, it was given by, I think, a uh, donor partner because for the president's travel. And because they wanted to travel, if the money goes to the government um, treasury, it's going to take days for them to be able to have access. So they had to put it through the first lady's foundation so they can have access to it and be able to hire a flight to travel. This was what the minister, Ibrahim Asila, had said in one interview. Ibrahim so, doesn't know anything about accounting. He doesn't know anything about transmittal of information. I think Ibrahim talks, Ibrahim doesn't know what he's talking about. If, to me, Ibrahim is one person who just abandoned UDP only to sacrifice himself for battle. So he's, he's a spokesperson. I have never seen in my life a minister of communication tries to be the spokesperson for the government. I disagree with his statement because the money came from China to Singapore, Singapore to Portugal, Lisbon, and then ended up at the unguaranteed, untrust bank of the Gambia. So what I don't understand, are you telling me is that the folks at the Ministry of Finance were ill-prepared for transmittal of funds from Lisbon to Gambia and a minister who has never taken a single course in economics or finance can try to educate Gambians about this so-called fallacy. I believe that Ibrahima doesn't know what he was talking about.
No, that was the explanation. I was just trying Thank to you. give you the explanation. That was the explanation. Yes. And that is, and these are the reasons why you think this government should be voted out. Yeah, it should be voted. You know, I, for me, I believe this government cannot be voted out if we, if each of and every one of us, if I want to take my own share to say I want to form a political party. Someone says they want to form a political party. We all say we're going to run against Barrow. The status quo is going to win. And we will regret it to our graves. So why don't we wait until 2021? No. Why rush it now in December? No, Barrow made a promise that he would step down in three years, so he has to oblige. A promise is a promise. Back in the day... Does that, are you also worried about the fragile situation of our security? Well, that one... Is, well, Barrow hasn't done anything about it because... Gambian security forces have been trained by non-speaking Africans. And transformation of information, to me, in my view, will be miscommunicated. And our system, how can we be adopting the French system of security when we were colonized by the British, when we have been speaking English for all these years, only to be transformed into French speaking? It doesn't matter. What does, matters? In what my, matters? In my, in, my, mean, in, my, in my view, communication is essential. It's, it's essential. But it, it's, changing, it's changing the mental capacity of the Gambian soldier. I believe that we have capable people in the Gambian military who can train our people. I believe that there are trained people in Nigeria, Ghana, or Sierra Leone, or Liberia who can train our people. But to make the francophone training to our Gambian soldiers, I think, is disservice to our mental capacity. Finally, Doctor, what's your message to Gambians and, of course, the government? We are running out of time. Well, my advice is that uh, be civil in your political engagement mm -hmm. and be respectful to, to, to others. Uh, accept dissenting views. And uh, I enjoy my stay here in the Gambia, even though Someone has threatened to deport me. I said, well, you who deport, deport you? You deport me, I go to Senegal and who, say, yeah. Who? Someone not, threatened I, to deport you? Yes, I said, I'm Oh, not, you don't have a government ID or what? Do you have a government ID? I'm glad you brought that topic. Do you have a government ID? No. When Yajame overthrew the government, I returned my passport. So I, I returned my so passport. So as we speak, you are not even qualified to run as any... Kid. Yeah, but I, you see, this is... Because this is you I, don't even have an ID card. Yeah, but... I don't have an ID card, but they gave me a visa. Yeah, but that's an American passport. Well, yes, but I'm a Gambian. No, you're not. Right now, you're not. This is why we cannot develop. No, but right Be now... No, you're... no, this is why we cannot develop. Because we contribute. According to their own tabulation, we contribute more than 25% to the GDP. But in the Gambia, they are saying that, oh, we love your money. Do you know that if... If we stop remitting money, I know that a month, this country will every every, every almost but every corner. It is a Why would you send your passport? Why would you return your government passport? Because I believe that a, a a democratically elected government of South Dakota was overthrown by a military dictatorship. So as a Gambian, I return my passport. And I still believe in, do you know, I wrote to each and every member of Jamais government to resign, including the former vice president, Fatumata Jallo Tambaja. And you can ask her, she'll tell you that I did write to her to resign. So it was Gambian for me. She was not, she was a minister of health. Health, yeah. yes, I yeah. did. Mm. So, so but what my question is, it's been two years since Jamais left. Mm -hmm. Why don't you at least have an ID card? No, because, the, you see... I tend to be a very ethical person. Mm. If the Constitution says I cannot have A, B, C, and D, why then would I come here secretly, have a Gambian passport, and then fly from the U.S., come with a Gambian passport, but then when getting to Washington, D.C., show my, my, my U.S. passport, I think that it's hypocrisy. So let's just say doctor is not a Gambian as we speak now. You, no. are, you are an American. No, no, no. So but doctor, but, but, you are not qualified to run in any office in this country as we speak. Yeah, this is why we cannot do No, but uh, you are Listen, not qualified. I'm not, running, I'm not running for office. No, I'm just saying you because you don't hold any, you cannot even run for Pirang MP because you don't, you don't have an ID card. You don't well, even have we, a bad certificate. But I, I, can, I can sponsor a candidate. But you don't even have a bad certificate. I do. I do. No, I do have a birth certificate. No, I do. do. Okay. Yeah. But can I tell you, I will sponsor a candidate and it will be a coalition 
candidate because I believe that we need to have educated people in Parliament who can speak for the average Gambian. Every single time, again, I'm going to repeat myself, a Gambian gets up in the morning with no food to eat. Every single morning, a Gambian parent worries about paying... Does it have to be an educated person, like the presidency, like the National Assembly? Does it have just have to be the educated folks? Yeah, I, I believe that. Because, doctor... I, I, yeah, I do. I, what, I, what, what, what do you call education? At what, what level do college, you call education? At least you have to have a college degree. Like, uh, at least a bachelor's degree, yeah, right? I do believe that. So, as a president, you mean at least you should have a bachelor's degree? Yeah. Wow. You know why? You know why? 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 I, I, I listened to one Nigerian former minister on the Obasanjo. Mm -hmm. He said the reason why Nigeria is what it is today is because so many educated Nigerians ran away from politics. And I believe in the Gambia is the same. Can you believe a presidential advisor to Baro, who doesn't even have a standard two education, is advising the president on, on policy. I'm not, I'm not naming names, you know, who I'm talking you, about. No, you cannot name, on you the cannot Sardana, name on, names on, on, on this show, no. On the Sardana's <laughs> government, on the Sardana's government, for you to even be commissioner or assistant commissioner, you must have gone through some system of uh, civil service before you can get to that. But now you have known high school graduates, assistant commissioner. So... If you look at the if you look at the civil service structure of our government, I talk to so many civil servants. I even made a joke. I say, a principal internal auditor in the Gambia makes seventy nine thousand dollars a year. I said, how are you able to survive on that? I asked this question. How about getting from Sanyang or even Busumbala or even Brikama to come to work? How do you get to work? through a subsidy from the government, and they said that's not enough. So I believe that if we can restructure our revenue collection system, which I hope, I wish we had talked about, mm -hmm. because I don't believe in this GRA system, but I believe that if we can restructure our revenue system, Gambia civil servants can get double pay in salary. The Gambia Revenue Authority for the past two years have doubled their revenue. I think it's also, I think what we should also look at maybe as a government is our spending. Because at the end of the day, the government spending, the budget, the budget, for example, last year, we had to end up going back to the, to the assembly to get approval for a supplementary. Yeah, because, because some we, budgetary supports did not come. Yeah, we, yeah. Oh, yeah and that's what I was saying. Yeah. I, I was saying that grant money, because I, I debated, yeah. I said, I teach accounting, and we accountants believe in conservatism. I said, if someone makes a promise on grant, it's not realizable. Mm -hmm. All of it is not. It's, it's not realizable. On, if for you to be able to uh, record a grant, grant revenue, it has to be available and realize. It has to be measurable and realizable. Baro just created a ministry of, for women affairs that has not been debated in parliament. Baro increased the size of his advisors tripled. Baro spends anyhow he wants. So it seems like he has the he has the checkbook to our treasury, and as a result, guess what? They would, they would have to ask for supplementary approval because they spend more than what was budgeted for. If you go to the Ministry of Finance, you cannot find the 2018 actual revenue and actual expenditure for us to be able to correlate whether we had any deficit or surplus. If you go now, we are in, we are in August. August 15th, 2019, this government cannot tell you actual revenue, actual expenditure for first quarter ending uh, March 31, 2018. So it seems like we have blind people who are riding, don't know where we're going. Yes, I do agree with you that because of the size of government, that I even believe the Gambia, we, shouldn't, we should have no more than 11 ministerial mm -hmm. positions. We are not talking about cutting down the civil service. But I cannot believe you having two permanent secretaries. I thought we had one. And you go out there with all this. Some, it, some permanent, some, some ministries it, it, have, it, it, like it, finance, they have too. It, some ministries I, have I, too. I, I was there and I yeah. was shocked when I saw that. Mm -hmm. I said, this is crazy. So we have this duplication of services. And the centralized office, I don't know where the... Statistics? No, centralized something office where they have almost a billion in, in budget. And I was just wondering... But why are we getting, and getting all these ambassadorial positions, creating all these all this, all this positions and so forth? 
And then, do you know Gambia's budget is almost 45 to 50 percent of Gambia's budget is subsidized by aid from outside. We've been independent since 1965, and up to this day, we are still begging. I'm wondering when we're going to be responsible for our own destiny. I believe if the Gambia can decide to say, you know, in one year, we are not going to ask for any grant money. We are going to curtail our, our loan, uh, borrowing, our borrowing system. I bet the Gambia as a country will not be affected. But when you go out there, because when they see us, because Barra was bragging about 1.45 billion that the European Union was going to send to us. I bet we have received less than 10% of that. So, you see... But it's for a five-year period. Yeah. <laughs> it's for a five-year period. Yeah, but... Well, yeah, but we gave our 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 seat to the European Union, right? So what is happening in the Gambia? What is happening in the Gambia? We don't have creativity. See, if you look at Rwanda, what Rwanda is doing, we don't have to go to the Western countries. I don't even believe that IMF should be telling us what we have to do, because these are visiting economists mm -hmm. who have no idea about what is going on. Yeah, our people come down and bring numbers to us. They look at it, even, oh, even doing this creative accounting on the, on the debt to, equity, uh, debt to uh, GDP ratio from 129 to 89. In my view as an accountant, I say that is creative accounting. All they did was they went out there and said, oh, we did not include horticulture in our computation. And I say, well, if you're going to do that, you need to, you need to have some kind of audit that you can base reliability on. But you went out subjectively, made some numbers, increased the denominator, you left the numerator, of course the result is gonna be lower. And now we are fooling ourselves to say that Gambia's debt to, uh, Gambia's, uh, debt to GDP has uh, decreased from 129 to 89%. I think that is fallacy. And I'm telling you, Gambia as a country, uh, it's very sad. So I believe that we had a change in government, but not a system change. Not a system. And if we don't have capable people of running the affairs of our country, I'm afraid we will continue to stretch our hands to beg until we die. And that should not happen because Gambians here are talented, educated. They are willing to sacrifice for their country if only they are given the chance. Sophie, me ola bu sel te ner. Bax na ci halal ak mak yep amna calcium, iron, protein ak vitamin yu bari. Sophie, full cream powder milk la amna 20 g, 200 g ak 400 g. Koko nyam do tu ko bayi. Sophie, proudly Gambian better and stronger as the sole ground operator at the Banjul International Airport. With an expansion in travel services, customers are assured of GIA's capacity to cater for all their travel needs, provided by professional, experienced and ever-smiling staff. GIA's Hajj package and services by far the best in the country give the customers the opportunity for a memorable Hajj experience. For a more efficient cargo services, GIA means business as it launches its new multi-million dollar ultra-modern cargo complex to revitalize and stimulate air transport. GIA, the pride of the Gambia. Thank you very much, Dr. K Dr. Conte. Mm -hmm. It's always nice having a discussion with you. Thank you. And uh, I think a lot of people will enjoy this conversation. Of course, the government also will learn something from this. And, you know, maybe, just maybe, people like you should also try to work with the government to see how we can improve the economy, especially, and also the education system. I'm willing, I'm willing, I'm willing. I, in fact, uh, I have a letter formulated to the 
permanent secretary, but I was shocked when I went there. There was no business card, no Thank email you. address. Thank you very much, Doctor. Good night to you all. Thank you. See you next week. Bye bye.